Welcome to Magnifica TV News, dedicated to offering the news of the Church. Today is Wednesday, August 10, 2022, and these are our headlines. The Vatican has announced that the Pope will travel to Kazakhstan in September to participate in a Congress of World Religions. Dictator Denny Ortega of Nicaragua has ordered the closure of Catholic radio stations and threatened the bishop, who has had to march in the streets with the Blessed Sacrament. <music> Cardinal Onayekan of Nigeria has called on Christians to defend themselves and not remain passive while under attack by Muslims. <music> A group of Italian lay people have written to German bishops, asking them not to go ahead with the synod way because it will provoke a schism. A Chinese bishop has demanded that his priests be faithful to the Communist Party, threatening to forbid them for celebrating Mass if they do not. The Pope will travel to Kazakhstan to participate in a meeting of religious leaders from around the world. It will take place from September 13 to September 15. As announced by the Holy See Press Office, Pope Francis will make his apostolic journey to Kazakhstan from September 13 to 15. During this visit, the Pope will have five interventions, four of which will be speeches and one homily. He will depart at 7 a.m. from Fiumicino Airport for Nur Sultan, where he will arrive at 5.45 p.m. local time. Afterwards, at 6.30 p.m., the welcome ceremony will be held at the Presidential Palace of Nur Sultan. Immediately after, at 6.45 p.m., the pontiff will pay a courtesy visit to the President of the Republic. The Holy Father will deliver his first speech at the Kazakh Concert Hall during the meeting with the authorities, civil society, and the diplomatic corps at 7.30 p.m. The following day, Wednesday, September 14th, Pope Francis will begin his public activities at 10 a.m. with his participation in the silent prayer of religious leaders and the opening of the plenary session of the 7th Congress of Leaders of World and Traditional Religions at the Place of Peace and Reconciliation, where he will deliver his second speech. Around noon, the Holy Father will hold private meetings with some religious leaders at the Palace of Peace and Reconciliation. The attendance of the Patriarch of Moscow, with whom the Pope wishes to meet, to discuss peace in Ukraine is not yet certain. In the afternoon, at 4.45 p.m., the pontiff will preside at the celebration of Holy Mass in Exposition Square, where he will deliver his homily. Meanwhile, on Thursday, September 15th, at 9 a.m., Pope Francis will meet privately with members of the Society of Jesus at the Apostolic Annunciature. Later, at 10.30 a.m. in the Cathedral of the Mother of God of Perpetual Help, the Holy Father will meet with the bishops and pastoral agents. He will address uh, his third speech to them. In the afternoon, at 3 p.m., the final declaration and conclusions of the Congress will be read at the Palace of Peace and Reconciliation. Here the pontiff will deliver his final speech. At the conclusion of this event, Pope Francis will proceed to Nur Sultan International Airport, where the farewell ceremony will take place at 4.15 p.m. The Pope will arrive in Rome the following day. Nicaraguan dictator Daniel Ortega has ordered the closure of several Catholic radio stations and threatened a bishop. By order of dictator Daniel Ortega, the church radio station in Matagalpa has been closed. Radio Católica de Sebaco, Radio Nuestra Señora de Lourdes, La Dalia, 
Radio Aliens de San Dionisio, Radio Monte Carmelo de Rio Blanco, Radio San Jose de Matiguas, and Radio Santa Lucia de Ciudad de Rio were also closed. In the statement of the Diocese of Matagalpa, its bishop, Bishop Rolando Alvarez, invited the people of God to continue bending their knees next Thursday, the day of the Holy um, Cure of Ours, praying for the protection and sanctification of priests, and on Friday, August 5th, a day of fasting and prayer, because prayer will save Nicaragua. Precisely on that day, the seat of the bishopric where Bishop Alvarez resides was surrounded by the police to prevent the access of the faithful to the ceremony. In response to the bishop's protest, the head of the department police of Matagalpa, Sergio Gutierrez, asked the bishop to cooperate and to refrain from celebrating the Mass. Those who do not cooperate are the police because they do not let the priests, the choir, the seminarians, the boys who are going to transmit my moment of Eucharistic prayer, pastoral care, communion and prayer, the bishop replied. To show his determination, Bishop Alvarez went out to the street with the Blessed Sacrament exposed in the monstrance and confronted the police. After an hour, the police accepted that two priests could enter the parish, and so the bishop was able to celebrate the Eucharist without parishioners, although it was transmitted live through the social networks. <laughs> The Nigerian Cardinal Onayekan has asked Christians to abandon their passivity in the face of the attacks they received and to get organized to defend themselves. The Archbishop Emeritus of Abuja, Cardinal Onayekan, took advantage of his presence at the Plenary Assembly of the Episcopal Conferences of Africa and Madagascar to warn of the situation in Nigeria. The colonel assures that there is great insecurity throughout the country, people are being killed every day, bandits and terrorists seem to have a free hand. We do not know where the security forces are. He added, the security situation in Nigeria is getting out of hands. No one is safe, not only Christians. The colonel pointed out that both Christians and Muslims are victims of violence perpetrated by criminals. Since 2009, when Boko Haram, one of the largest Islamist groups in Africa, emerged with the aim of turning the country into an Islamic state, Nigeria has suffered continuous terrorist attacks against both religious and political groups, as well as civilian groups. The situation has become even more complicated by the involvement of the Muslim-majority Fulani herdsmen, also known as the Fulani militia who have often clashed with Christian farmers. This was confirmed by the Archbishop Emeritus of Abuja. My answer is that Christians must remain firmly Christian and know how to be faithful to their religion. We must start working on the means to defend ourselves against criminals. Our religion does not say that we should sit back and let ourselves be killed. We have every right to defend ourselves. A sign of uncertainty that the synod journey of the church in Germany is causing is a letter from a group of lay people to Bishop Batsin. The letter is dated July 30th of this year and has been signed so far by exclusively lay faithful from the northern Italian region. The promoter of the letter is a lawyer named Giuseppe Sola from Milan. The signatories are concerned about the unity of the Church, one of the danger of adapting to the spirit of the times, and call on the German synodal way to unashamedly confess Jesus Christ, who is the only guarantee of living a new life. The reason for the appeal, they say in the introduction to the text, is the lukewarm response of the Presodium of the Synodal Way to the Declaration of the Holy See of July 21st in which the Vatican had warned against imposing on the faithful new structures and doctrines that violate universal ecclesial unity. On his part, Colonel Mueller spoke again about the German Synod, referring to the declaration of the Holy See, which warned of the risk of schism. 
Rome has reacted late, but perhaps not too late, says Müller. The anti-Catholic machinations of the German synodal heresy, which are diametrically opposed to Catholic teaching on the revelation and obedience of the faith, on the hierarchical sacramental constitution of the Church, and on the dignity of marriage and the family. <laughs> The submission of some bishops to the Chinese government has reached to a point that one of them has demanded the priests be faithful to the Communist Party. On July 15th, the Bishop of Boating, Bishop Francis Anne Shuzing, published a pastoral letter on the civil registration of the clergy in the Diocese of Boating. Its text is very clear. All priests must register with the authorities or they will not be able to administer the sacraments. In the letter, the bishop reports that more than 30 priests have concelebrated with him in recent months, and he cites the 2018 Sino-Vatican Agreement, the pastoral guide on the civil registration of clergy in China, June 2019, and other papal statements to encourage all clergy to officially register and all faithful in the diocese to accept registered clergy to foster the unity of the diocese. And he threatened, otherwise the suspension of the sacraments will be carried out. He also stressed that the special privileges granted by the Holy See in June 1978 to unregistered clergy had been abolished so the civil authorities will deal with violators in accordance with the law and regulations. Some priests suffered a nervous breakdown after assigning obedience to the Communist Party. Others repented and then felt very sorry. Other priests, after becoming officials, were rejected by their own parishioners and had to return home and isolate themselves. <laughs> Our editorial this week is dedicated to remember the figure of the English writer Chesterton on the centenary of his conversion to Catholicism. Last week, July 30th, was the 100th anniversary of Chesterton's entrance into the Catholic Church. Chesterton, unfortunately, remains unknown to the vast majority of Catholics. For others, however, among whom I include myself, is not only the king of paradoxes, the author of phrases that make you think and sometimes laugh, or great books with which to spend an entertaining time as the novels that have Father Brown as the protagonist. Chesterton, for many I repeat and certainly for me, is spiritual father, and it's a spiritual father that helps me to live as a Catholic in a time like this, in which many within the Catholic Church are determined to continue calling themselves Catholics and to continue belonging to a church that they want to be called Catholic but at the same time they are trying to stop it from being Catholic. They want to be Catholics in the Catholic Church without the Catholic Church being Catholic. This is a paradox and of course this is what we're living in. Chesterton helps me a lot in this. I'm going to read some of the things I have written because there are many phrases, although not all of them, of course, which I want to quote. Just to list the phrases of Chesterton that have made me think, pray, and even be ashamed of myself, I would need many hours. The same happens to me with the books of him that I have read. I don't know if they are all, but certainly they are all that I have found and there are many, although in none I have found more wisdom than in his autobiography. It is in that book, above all, where I discovered him as my spiritual master, especially with regard to the virtue which I consider most exalted and necessary. Obviously, after the three theological virtues, I am referring to the virtue of humility. When Chesterton speaks of the contempt we feel towards that plant so vulgar, so common, which is called the dandelion, that plant that is in all lawns, in all meadows, that produces little yellow flowers which then give an inflorescence full of its seeds, forming a ball that when blown spreads everywhere, hence the key to its success. When he says that we feel contempt for this very common plant, 
He invites us to think about whether in reality this contempt is due to the fact that we consider it to be too little for what we deserve. When he describes the indignation of the English gentleman who protests because he considers the culette he has just been served in the select club to which he belongs to be insufficient for him, and complains to the waiter saying, Is this a culette worthy of a gentleman? The problem, Chesterton helps us to understand, the problem is not in the culette, the problem is in the concept that you have of yourself, because that same culette, the same one, would be received with joy at the table of a worker. If you consider that you deserve the best of the best because you are extraordinary, then in this life everything will taste little to you, and then you will enjoy nothing or practically nothing. The problem is not in the culette, but in our pride. This vision of life, this perception of humility, that virtue that helps me to place myself as I am in front of what reality is. This phrase is from St. Augustine, Lord, may I know you and may I know myself. This helps me enormously every time I have the insidious temptation to think that I deserve more than what I get. I have learned from Chesterton to give thanks for the vulgar dandelion and for the not so good culette they put on my plate because both are wonderful gifts that I do not really deserve although the great teacher of my life without my merit is the Virgin Mary from whom I have learned almost everything in the chapter of gratitude that constitutes the essence of the charism of the Franciscans of Mary Chesterton has not been an occasional ray of light illuminating a night of stormy darkness, but a permanently burning spotlight. There can be no gratitude without humility, and there can be no humility without one's knowing who God is, and what God has done for him, and how little one deserve it oneself. Only in this way it is possible to live in permanent amazement before a sunset, as if it were the first time you see it, even though you see it almost every day, or to thank God because you have a culette to eat, even if it is not of the highest quality, humility precedes thankfulness and provokes it. Chesterton says, when we were children we were grateful to those who filled our stockings for Christmas, why not thank God for filling our stockings with our feet? Chesterton says this and invites us, helps us to realize that we should not only give thanks for our socks, but for our feet. Even if we didn't have socks or didn't have the best socks in the world. In his wonderful biography of St. Francis, which I highly recommend, he says, Francis mixed all his thoughts with his gratitude because he had discovered that he owed God an infinite debt. And in another of his works, he returns to this thought. It constitutes the highest and holiest of words that he who knows very truly that he will not be able to pay his debt is always paying it, always throwing things into a bottomless abyss of unfathomable gratitude, amazement, humility, gratitude, Three virtues that I have discovered more deeply thanks to Chesterton. But also, as I said, I consider him a master to face the confusing times in which we are living. He became a Catholic because he discovered that here is the fullness of truth, and even then he felt disappointed with the Anglican flexibility. He was looking for certainties and not relativism and he found them in the Catholic Church. Perhaps today that disappointment would be produced by a sector of this Catholic Church so different from the one he entered. What he said about Christ is valid today even more than then, when they try to modernize his message by suppressing what the world does not like. He said, 
There is no word of truth in that the ideas of Jesus of Nazareth were adequate to his time and no longer adequate to ours. The end of his story suggests, perhaps, to what extent they were precisely inadequate to his time or that other phrase about what he was looking for and found in the Catholic Church. We don't want a religion that is right when we are right. What we want is a religion that is right when we are wrong. A religion where one can interpret the Second Vatican Council after Chesterton in continuity with tradition without being thrown out of the church for it or where you can pray the rosary without being seen as a freak, as a traditionalist enemy of the true faith. He says, I don't want to belong to a religion in which I am allowed to possess a crucifix. I have the same feeling in regard to that other matter more exposed to the controversy of men, that of the Blessed Virgin. If people don't like that cult, they are right not to be Catholic, but I want those who are Catholic to be called Catholic. I want that idea to be not only pleasing to them, but that they love it and love it ardently, proclaiming it proudly above all else. I want to be allowed to be enthusiastic about the existence of enthusiasm and not that my greater enthusiasm be coldly tolerated as if it were a personal eccentricity. A time, ours, that was fearfully foreseen by an English saint who preceded Chesterton in his conversion to Catholicism, Colonel Newman, who initiated the so-called Oxford movement which attracted so many to the Catholic Church, seeking precisely those certainties that Chesterton found in her. Newman wrote, I thank God to live in an age when the enemy is outside the church and to know where he is and what he is up to, but I foresee a day when the enemy will be both inside and outside the church, and I pray now for the poor faithful who will be victims of a crossfire, but it's in this age, here and now, that we must love the Lord and for love of him defend the faith against the enemy within and outside with enough humility not to think we are the saviors of the world because only christ is the savior and with enough good humor not to take ourselves too seriously and with enough humility to thank god when we have a cutlet on our plate even if it's not the cutlet worthy of a gentleman, among other things, because I don't know if that English gentleman deserved the cutlet, but we certainly don't deserve it. See you next week, God willing. If you wish to be up to date about what is happening in the church, you can follow us on our news page, www.magnifica.tv. See you in two weeks, God willing.